Hi. <laughs> Hi, Devanjan. You... Yeah, Hi, can, can you hear me? Yeah, we uh, can hear you. Right. Okay. I think we're getting the tech right. Yes. Hello. It's all good. Hello. Hi. Okay, Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hey. So Hi, good Devanjan. to see all of you. And it's a real pleasure to meet you online. Uh, in these very troubled times. Um, let me just quickly check the controls. Yeah, I have the mute button. I can see the uh, video button. So, uh, and the chat seems to be working. Uh, yeah. So, Devanjan, we'll be using, yes. I, this is Shanya, by the way. Hi. Um, Hi. We'll be Hi, using, Hi the, we'll be using the Q&A box. Um, like I told you, we'll be yeah. using the yeah, so you you've seen that made a note of it, and um, yeah, yeah. We'll Nita and I and whoever from team belong will. If there's anything, we'll we'll let you know on the chat box. Just just to communicate with you because we don't want to interrupt Brilliant. the session. And yeah, I'll, I'll log off so, now. Um, yeah. Okay. You will communicate with me on the. Q and A. So, which is the panelist? So, there is a chat and there's a Q and A. Uh, yeah, thing. yeah. Give a Q and A so, box. We are is for viewer engagement, so viewers can send in their questions, and the the chat box is where we can on the Q and A. So, Q and A is the more public one, and the chat is just for us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you okay. yeah, just to make sure that we're yeah. only speaking to each other, you just have to make sure that the setting is on all panelists. But it's fine. I'm sure it'll be okay. Yeah. So the only thing we need to worry about in Q and A, but also we'll all be here. So don't stress. I think my chat is disabled. Um, ah, is that, okay. Uh, I think it's because you were. Uh, uh, it's because he was bumped up. Yeah, yeah. So is there anything I can do, Manjri? Uh, uh, Shania, I can make him a co-host. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Right. Um, I think uh, a challenge is because uh, our office laptops have huge amount of security layers, uh, which I don't understand, but it doesn't allow us to um, allow a lot of things, uh, especially on Zoom. It's okay. I think everything is fine. Hi, I think I have got, uh, can you see my message? I think you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All good. So, yeah. yeah. And De Debanjan, your voice is better. breaking up Hi. quite a bit. Your voice is, is breaking it? up. Um, you might want to keep the okay. microphone just a little away from you. Oh, okay. Uh, this is uh, kind of a default setting I have. I can't do I, too much yeah, with I, this. I, I think it's fine. Yeah. All right. Okay. Is it all right? With some. Uh, Hi. Let me know if we should um, uh, kick off. And yes, um, any housekeeping announcements, please go ahead. All right. I'm just going to start with that now and then I will hand it over back to you, Devanjan. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Nitya and I'm from Team Belong. The Belong Online Literature Festival of Bulk is an initiative of Belong a social venture that seeks to bring discrimination-free services and experiences to people who face identity-based discrimination. We run programs for inclusive housing, inclusive mental health, inclusive research, as well as a book club and a library for inclusive literature. You can learn more about these on www.belong.net. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge the tireless efforts of our festival partners the VIA, our media partner, our cultural partner, the British Council, and our accessibility partner, Access for All, without whom this event would not be possible. Now on to today's session. The session is on feeling at home in the world, immigrant identity and belonging, with Guru Prasad Kaginele, Mitali Perkins, and Jenny Bhatt. The, sessions will be, the session will be moderated by Debanjan Chakrabarti. Dibal is, is Director of British Council East and Northeast India. He has over 18 years of experience in leading education, development, and cultural collaboration programs in India and internationally for the British Council. In his present role, he leads all of British Council's business and cultural relations work in East and Northeast India, covering 13 Indian states and Bhutan. A triple gold medalist in English literature from Jadavpur University, Calcutta, 
Debanjan is a Felix scholar and obtained his PhD in literature and media studies from the University of Reading. He has been a journalist and taught English literature and, and, and taught English literature and films at Viswa Bharati University in Shanti Niketan and at the University of Reading. Debanjan is a keen sportsman, an avid reader, and a cinephile. He occasionally writes for national and international publications on education, books, sports, and films. Before I hand it over to Debanjan, a couple of housekeeping announcements. During the first 45 to 50 minutes of this session, the moderator will ask the panelists their questions. While this is happening, you should feel free to send in your own questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. The moderator will take some some of these questions during the last 30 to 35 minutes of the session. Please keep your questions short and to the point wherever possible. If your question exceeds five lines, we won't be able to take it since, it, since we need to optimize for both time and number of questions. Please make sure to send in your questions while the moderator is speaking to the panelists. That is during the first 50 minutes of the session. We will not be accepting any questions at that point in time. And lastly, we are recording all our sessions and will be uploading them to our YouTube channel in the days to come. So in case you have friends who are unable to make session or you yourself would like to rewatch it, you know where to find it. We are also sending all these instructions on the chat box so you can refer to them later on if needs need be. That's all for me. Now over to you, Debanjan. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to the session feeling at home uh, in the world. Uh, immigrant identity and belonging. Uh, good evening, uh, afternoon and morning, uh, depending on where you are in this uh, wide world of ours. Um, it's a great privilege to be chairing the session on behalf of the British Council, which is one of the partners of uh, the Belong Online Literature Festival. British Council, as most of you may know, is the UK's international organization for cultural relations and education. Uh, we have been partnering with a number of organizations since the global pandemic unfolded. Uh, online festivals on uh, uh, th thoughts and ideas and in literature. Uh, it's part of our festivals connect work uh, across India and across the world. Um, yesterday, as part of uh, the Belong Festival, we screened all our British Council, British uh, Film Institute, Flair Festival films on uh, LGBTQI. Uh, my colleague, Jonathan Kennedy, who's director of arts for British Council in India, uh, was the convener of a session uh, yesterday on imagining a new world, utopia and dystopias through the lens of writers from India with a strong uh, feminist and uh, transgender content in, in those conversations. This particular session uh, um, aligns with our long-term cultural values uh, about inclusion, but also I think British Council is responding to and tapping into the Zeet Geist uh, of our times. We are uh, talking not just about inclusion, but also it's a time for empathy of compassion and kindness and giving everyone a voice and finding our own voices. Um, and I think uh, this uh, uh, in sync with British Council, uh, the Belong Lit Fest is opening up new audiences uh, and access to diversity of authors um, with equality of access and inclusion of writers whose voice, voices are often too marginalized. This particular uh, topic, feeling at home in the world, uh, immigration, identity and belonging, um, reminds me of uh, Rabindranath Tagore's uh, great novel, The Home and the World, uh, Ghore Bayere in, in Bengali, translated as Home and the World. It's also very topical in many ways. I think stories of migration and immigration have fascinated us through human history uh, and more recently. Uh, uh, it, uh, the, the, the topic has haunted us. Um, I'm thinking of uh, the journalist Paul Salopek's uh, epic journey tracing the footsteps of humankind's migration out of Africa uh, as part of a national geographic uh, pro project. Uh, I'm thinking of the shocking image of Ailan Chenu, the three-year-old uh, Syrian refugee child who drowned in the Mediterranean Sea on the beaches of Turkey while fleeing religious persecution in uh, Syria. 
um, and haunting stories and images of migrant laborers trying to reach their homes uh, uh, from Indian cities after the announcement of the sudden lockdown in India in end of March. Uh, especially 16 uh, migrant laborers were run down by a goods train on the 7th of May. And those images of their meager belongings, including dry chapatis, uh, their blood smeared uh, uh, chapels um, scattered on the railway tracks are uh, haunting and uh, topical. So in the long sweep of history, the big question is who is not a, a migrant or an immigrant? Um, uh, I'm also thinking in terms of the uh, writing traditions of other languages in India. So Syed Mujtaba Ali in Bangla uh, had written extensively about his experience of living in Afghanistan and Berlin and across the uh, Indian subcontinent, the undivided uh, uh, pre-independence Indian subcontinent. Uh, I'm thinking of the writings of Rahul Sankritan in, in Hindi, who wrote extensively about his uh, uh, itinerant um, yeah, ways of life uh, uh, from across the world, primarily Egypt and in, 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 uh, uh, so in erstwhile Soviet Union, all of that. So I'm incredibly excited to be um, chairing a panel with three very, very exciting authors from around the world uh, today. Um, let me quickly introduce them to you. Um, we have with us today Jenny Bhatt. Jenny is a writer, a literary translator, a literary critic, and a podcast host. She has worked her way around India, England, Germany, um, Scotland, and various parts of the US. She now lives in a suburb of Dallas in Texas. She's the host of the DC Books podcast. Her short story collection, Each of Us Killers, will be out on 8th of September this year with 7.13 books. Her fiction has been nominated for Pushcart Prizes and the 2017 Best American Short Stories. She was a finalist for the 2017 Best of the Net Anthology. She tweets from at Jenny Bhatt. The second author we have with us is Mitali Perkins. Mitali Bose Perkins has written many books for young readers, uh, including Between Us and Abuela, Forward Me Back to You, You Bring the Distant Near, and Rickshaw Girl, which has been adapted into a film by Sleeper Wave Productions. She was born in Kolkata, also incidentally a city I call home, and immigrated with her parents to California, where she currently lives and writes. Her books have won many awards, the America's Award for Children's and Young Adult Literature, SLJ, and the Kirkus Best Young Adults Book of the Year. She tweets from uh, at Mitali Perkins. Um, the third author we have today is Guru Prasad Kaginele. He is a medical doctor by profession, lives with his family in Rochester, Minnesota, where he works at the Olmsted Medical Center. Kaginele has been a prominent voice in contemporary Kannada literature. He has published three short story collections, three novels, and two essay collections. He has also been the primary editor for two books published by the US-based group Kannada Sahitya Ranga. Some of his short stories have been translated into Telugu, Konkani, Malayalam, and English. His recent novel, Hijab, published in 2017, was adjudged the best novel of the year 2018. I, uh, I hope I'm back. Uh, my screensaver kicked in. Um, so, um, uh, and uh, Guru Prasad uh, tweets from at gkaginele1, uh, and he's also on Instagram. Uh, I suppose I'll kick off this conversation with an initial question to all three of my panelists. Uh, do you see yourself as an immigrant writer or or as a writer who writes about the immigrant experience. Starting off with Jenny, if I may come to you first, Jenny. Thank you, Dibanjan. Um, and thank you to Team Belong for uh, having all of us on this um, very interesting and uh, relevant uh, topic. So to answer your question, Dibanjan, I, I see myself 
as an immigrant writer who does not only write about immigrant experiences. So um, the, the reason is obviously I am an immigrant that is very much a part of my identity, but I think we get boxed into, uh, you know, certain topics when with some of these labels and I, I understand it is a function of uh, the publishing industry and and how they market and so you know we have this whole category or genre if you like called immigrant literature but i would like to think that my writing and my translation work and my criticism work isn't just focused on the immigrant experience uh, that said, of course, we can't escape from bringing our personal experiences to our reading. And so when I look at, in particular, when I look at South Asian literature or Desi literature, I'm certainly looking at it um, not just from a certain kind of um, a school of literary theory, but I'm also looking at it very much from a post-colonial lens, because that is part of my heritage as uh, somebody who was born and brought up in India. Uh, for the first 19 years of my life, so. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, I'll come back to you on that point in a bit. Uh, uh, if I may uh, come to you, Guru, for uh, um, addressing this uh, core question. Yeah, I am a bit uh, unique in this uh, aspect because I write in Canada. Uh, you know, I've been uh, in the United States for uh, last 25 years, uh, but I chose to, you know, write in Canada, uh, but I do write about my immigrant experience. Uh, and uh, I think the question that we need to ask ourselves is, uh, when do we cease to be an immigrant? You know, we came to America as immigrants, and what does, what, what, when does this immigration end? Is it like, because you know, once we get the American passport, you know, we become Americans. Uh, do we call ourselves our Amer Americans? Are our kids who have grown up here are they like Americans? And what is an American identity? I'll just uh, give you a small example. Uh, it's like a little story. You know, I work in the emergency room and I see patients from you know, different uh, cultural background. And uh, we have physicians from different background. And uh, it happened so that a uh, few months ago, uh, a 21 year old Caucasian checked in with abdominal pain and uh, he was greeted in the front door by a Sudanese uh, greeter. You know, she was the HUC, you know, health unit coordinator. And uh, he was checked in to the room and was taken care of by a Korean nurse and uh, me being uh, an Indian emergency room physician diagnosed him having appendicitis and we wanted him to be operated upon. And uh, when I told him that you need, a, you need to get surgery done uh, and then the business office, you know, who, who goes and collects this information and he happened to be a Somal Somali kid and the surgeon was from Tanzania. So, we are like all from all over and this, all of us are by legally, we are all Americans. And this kid wanted an American surgeon to operate on him. So we were kind of a little bit uh, like amused and uh, at the same time confused from his question and exactly uh, what do you mean uh, you want like American doctor, all of us are Americans? No, I'm just talking about, you know, in, his, in this kid's mind, I can call 21 year old kid because my daughter is 24. You know, in this kid's mind, uh, American is like, White. you know, defined by the skin, you know, the skin color more than anything. And, uh, you know, the funny part is some of these uh, 20, 21 year old, you know, the Somali, the office person who was registering, he was born in United States. So he was confused as to what his identity was. I think uh, this is like a question that we always have to ask ourselves. You know, the funny thing is when this kid decided to check himself out against medical advice to see an American doctor in a different hospital, he decided to walk out with his IV in and we need to chase him 
to bring him back to the hospital to pull the IV out. And the security guard happened to be another Somali. So he, he said, this kid says, you know, even when you kick me out of the hospital, they can't you find like an American security guard? And uh, I think this is something that we, you know, this whole theory of uh, melting pot versus Shashi Tharoor's tali, uh, we kind of, I think this uh, part itself is changing. What we feel right now is uh, what we used to melt in the part, but we have become a part of this melting part itself. You know, these quote unquote immigrants who come from different areas. So when I write about these experiences, uh, do I call this as human experience? I'm a human being uh, experiencing other human beings feelings or yeah. do I call this as an immigrant experience is always a question. So I think it all depends on when you define yourself as an immigrant and when this immigration process ceases. Right. Uh, I'll uh, come back to uh, that question, Guru, on, on how that impacts your writing. Uh, over to Mitali, uh, do you see yourself as an immigrant, immigrant writer or a writer who simply happens to write about that experience? Well, it's interesting. I'm right in the middle of that story, Guru. I want to know what happened to that kid. And you, you told that yeah, story. So exactly. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just uh, it, it's funny and it's sad at the same time. And it's uh, it, it, it really does highlight one of uh, one of the issues I face, which is that people, as Jenny said, try to box you in with one of your identities. Uh, one of them for me is an immigrant um, and I'm happy to stay there. But I also, I, I'm a mother. And so part of me responding to that story is from a mother heart. I'm thinking, oh, you dumb kid, go get your appendix out. What is wrong <laughs> with you? So I have many identities and they intersect around every story. So I would probably say the latter, that one of the things I write about is the immigrant experience. And yet I deeply cherish the immigrant identity as well. I feel it's a privileged identity because it gives you the capacity to see um, and also to feel compassion, I think, uh, on both sides of the story. You know, when Guru was telling that story, you, you can connect to each character because you have this ability to cross borders. I came as a child, and so I learned how to do that code switching uh, dance between cultures. And so I can enter into almost anyone's story because of that. So I, I'm very, I cling very fiercely to my identity as an immigrant because it gives me that capacity to cross borders. It's fascinating to hear that uh, the way you uh, say that that you know uh, being an immigrant is as a as a badge of honor as a uh, as it were. Um, uh, if I can continue with you, Mitali, before uh, going back to the others, uh, you were born in Calcutta and then moved to the U.S. Uh, at a young age with your parents. Uh, so, what does the idea, uh, the word home, mean to you, and how do you relate to uh, that to the idea of the world in your writing? Right. It's funny because uh, you were talking about Jadavpur University or and uh, my mom went there and uh, there's so many connections to Kolkata. I st it still feels like home when I go there because it's my mother tongue. And so language becomes a, a big part of that. But my husband says that because of this code switching capacity that I developed, when you come as a child, you have to survive in both worlds. I was in a majority white suburban um, middle school. And I had to learn how to, uh, you know, curl my hair the right way. And, and yet at home, my parents were, grew up in the villages of East Bengal. So it wasn't just, it wasn't sophisticated Bengali urban life. It was village Bengal at home. So I did that dance every day, California suburb, Bengali village. Because of that, my husband says that I've learned at this stage of my life, now that I'm older, I can make myself at home anywhere anywhere. He says, I go into an elevator, a lift, and, I'm, and I can make myself at home there and sort of create little bonds between people because I did that as a child. But at the same time, I don't feel at right. home anywhere. I, I feel at home nowhere. Nowhere really feels like when I go to Kolkata, um, you know, I'm, I'm a large Bengali woman and uh, most Bengali women are really small. So, you know, they have the ladies section there, the buses. So I hold on to the bar and all the little Bengali ladies hold on to my arm because I have that, that, that health and strength that, that came from. I don't know where that came from. I'm sort of an aberration. Um, but uh, so that, that could, so I think that just that identity of, of making myself at home everywhere, it's very easy to me. And I think that's when I think of the world, 
I think the, of the world as my place of service, a place where I can try to make others feel at home in my company and in my stories, especially children um, who often are trying to find where home is. So I think the world is the place of service right. and home is wherever I am and nowhere in the world. That's that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, hold on to that uh, thought uh, and we'll um, expand on that in a bit. Uh, Jenny, if I may uh, uh, come to you. In our conversations in the run up to this panel discussion, you observe that, um, uh, and I quote you, I've always agreed with what Jhumpa Lahiri uh, points out in a 2013 New York Times interview. Uh, I don't know what to make of the term immigrant fiction. Um, so my question to you is, uh, what do you make of the term immigrant fiction? Uh, thanks, Sabanjan. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what I said was I do agree with uh, Jhumpa Lahiri's point, which is that um, if you think about it, all American fiction is immigrant fiction because we've all come from somewhere in the U.S. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't the writer themselves, it was their parents or their parents' parents. And so, you know, in, in that sense, we're all uh, migrants. We're also migrants in terms of when we're writing fiction, we're living in other worlds, we are living in other lives. And I feel that that is also a kind of uh, transplantation or migration that happens, mm -hmm. uh, even though it is not a physical one. So, you know, again, as I said, I do understand that publishers and, uh, you know, marketing people um, and booksellers need to have a category called immigrant fiction or immigrant literature so they can direct people to that. And, and I do think, I mean, I went through a phase of my life where before I was able to skillfully code switch, you know, like Natalie said, I was drawn more to writing by Indian writers who were also immigrants because I felt that they spoke my language, they spoke about my challenges and my thoughts and my difficulties. So I can understand why there is a need for something called immigrant fiction. But I think it's the way that it is then marketed and perceived that it's as if that mm. is the overall thing that you find in that work. You're not, there, there are other stories, there are other aspects of human life as Guru Prasad was saying. So again, you know, I'm, I'm still very um, fluid on that term, but I, I find that all fiction is immigrant fiction. That, I agree with Jhumpa Lahiri on that. Right, right. Thanks. And we will come back to you on that with reference to your work. So let me come to Guru. Uh, um, uh, well, first let's hear the ending of that fantastic story. What happened to that young boy? Well, I told you that like, I think this kid uh, did get signed against medical advice. He, he checked into another hospital. Uh, we don't know about what happened to the kid. I hope right. uh, somebody he found the right doctor, whoever he thinks as American is, uh, to operate on him. You know, that's uh, we can only do so much. You know, <laughs> exactly. Which, which is a nice segue to um, the question I had for you next, which is about your uh, recent novel, Job, which has been translated to great critical acclaim uh, by Simon and Schuster into English. Uh, in 2018. The novel takes a very sharp look at the overlapping identities that we were speaking about of race, of faith, uh, and countries of origin among various immigrants uh, through the lenses of three Kannadiga doctors in a small town in Minnesota. Uh, has that novel uh, changed somewhat in the process of translation? And does translation itself can you repeat the second part of the question? I had a hard time hearing. Yeah, the second part of the question, you can come back to it a little later. Does uh -huh. the act of translation from Canada to English, is that a trans a migration of sorts? Yeah. A well, kind of literary a, migration, if you, if you like. Uh, that's a very like a interesting question because the process of translation, uh, when does it start for me is something, you know, this is the first work that was translated 
uh, from Kannada to English, you know, first of my works after nine books that I have written so far. Uh, and, you know, I never thought that any of my works would be translated. I'm like a full-time emergency medicine physician. So uh, writing came to me later, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, I, uh, so when I, I write about everything that, you know, by definition of immigrant fiction, whatever the definition of immigrant fiction belongs, I report, I mostly write immigrant fiction. You know, if there is a genre car like that. Uh, and then when I write about immigrant fiction, I am writing about America in Canada to Canada readers. So every character of mine in the novels, they speak, none of them speak Canada, but I have, I'll bring them back to this world of Canada where my reader can resonate his thoughts or their thoughts too. He can, he can identify with everything that's happening to them. So I have already begun the process of translation when I'm writing in Canada. So it's kind of everything that is happening in an English speaking country, I'm telling that story to Canada readers. So I need to make sure that everybody is on the same page. You know, language is just a medium for me to communicate my thoughts and whichever language that I can communicate my thoughts to my readers, which I'm comfortable in Canada, so I do that. So that is one process of the translation. The second process was when uh, this book in Canada, I was very surprised that, you know, this is happening in some Midwest, in a small town in Midwest, Midwestern America, and uh, Canada readers were really enthralled by reading this, and uh, there was potential for translation. So, uh, you know, when, when this process happened from Canada to English, it is bringing back the story back to Minnesota, uh, to English. And uh, who were the intended audience, you know, who were the intended readers at that time? Uh, it was kind of the translation, you know, I should make a mention of uh, my great translator, Pawan Rao, uh, who, who, with whom I worked with, uh, he, he made this translation process so fluid, we sat day in and day out, uh, working with each other on each draft. So have I gained or have we changed? I think we always feel that things get lost in translation. Uh, but I feel that this novel has uh, gained quite a bit in translation because uh, even though it's, it was, you know, I was the author, so we kind of were at liberty to make whatever changes that we thought was appropriate when we bring, brought it back to English. And uh, one of the changes was uh, we refer to a specific country uh, when we were uh, writing, when I was writing the Canada novel, and we made it as a fictional country when it when we brought back to English. I think if you read the novel, uh, you probably will know exactly why the change was made. I think uh, you know Devanjan did allude to this uh, in the email conversation. I said uh, uh, I will uh, expand on it when I'm talking about it. I think uh, the the reason is when you when in Canada. When you're writing in Canada, it gives you that distance, thinking that you know you are unconsciously this process is working in your mind that I'm writing to someone else. You know, I'm writing to Canada readers who may or may not get it. You know, it's not like deliberate, but it unconsciously works in your mind that your readers are different. And uh, when you're writing in English, all of a sudden it puts you in a different box where you all of a sudden think, start thinking about, am I appropriating the culture? Do I know about this culture? Because you know that like this will be read by wider audience and uh, I need to be, you know, I need to, I need to address all the concerns uh, before right. I write that. So that those kind of changes did happen. I think it happened for right. good. That's what I think, yeah. Mm. Thanks, thanks, Guru. Uh, if I can uh, come to you, uh, Mitali, uh, on uh, again related to what Guru was saying uh, and about his uh, novel, which is uh, founded 
uh, on his lived experience. Vitali, you yourself write about a range of subjects, uh, and most of your uh, work is aimed at young adults, and you choose subjects that range from immigration to poverty to human trafficking, microcredits, uh, and these are shaped by your own experience as well as your academic grounding in political science and public policy. Um, these are, so are these subjects a conscious choice that are founded on your lived and academic experience uh, and are they always autobiographical in nature? Uh, you know you know that finishing a novel from start to finish is the most torturous work you'll ever do so it has to be an idea that grips you and for me these issues of justice have always uh, been a passion of mine uh, when i studied in college i was my goal you know when you're young you have these high lofty ideals and i thought by the end of my life there'll be no child hungry on the earth and child hunger will be eradicated and It'll be due to me, of course, you know, so I had that lofty ideal that then you come crashing down when you hit reality. And I realized how powerful stories are, I think, around the time that I became a mother. And um, I had always read growing up and I had seen the power of a story, especially as I talked about the fluency of a child across borders that have that shuts down. Um, as you get older into your teen years, but a child is able to cross borders and imagine other lives much better than an adult. And I knew that my heart had been shaped by the books I'd read, uh, especially when it came to justice. So, um, you know, going back to my birth in Kolkata, Devanjan, it, it, was, um, it was my celebrity moment when I was born because I uh, was born in um, Sheba Shadan General Hospital and at the time I came, when I, when I emerged from my, my poor mother, I was almost 11 pounds heavy. And so I shattered the records of Sheba Shadan General Hospital. And I made the headlines in Kolkata that said, fattest baby ever born in Sheba Shadan General Hospital. So that was my celebrity moment. And I think, I, and we, my father was a port, uh, port engineer. So we traveled to, we lived in Cameroon and Ghana, Mexico. And I saw quite a lot of poverty growing up. And I think that privilege that I had growing into this, coming into this wonderful, healthy, educated family that gave me so much. It, and then the books I read as a child developed in me this desire to, to explore justice and for the for people with less privilege than I had. So I often explore those topics. I think, again, going back to the fact that um, when I'm in the middle of a novel, if I don't care about it deeply, I'm just gonna toss it. So I have to care about it very deeply. Right. So that, those are the issues right. I care about. Thanks, Bitali. Which also brings me to Jenny now. Uh, and again, it's a related question on, on uh, living a very itinerant life. Uh, Jenny, you have lived a, a very um, itinerant life in, in India, England, and Scotland. And I like the distinction that you make between England and Scotland. They, they are really very different kind very of different. cultures and two devolved nations. And Germany. Um, uh, so I was just wondering that how have you channelized living those lives in separate countries, maybe separate lives in separate countries uh, uh, in various cultures and channelize them into your writing? Uh, yes, thank you. Devanjan. So I, I never had a, a, a plan to go to all these places. Uh, most of my time in these places was driven because of my work. Um, I worked in the corporate sector before I turned to writing full time. And so I went where the job took me. And uh, maybe there's something as to me volunteering for some of those projects and opportunities as well. But, you know, I did end up going to these places for work. So, um, I, and I, I moved to the US, uh, I think it was 98. And then in the US as well, I worked my way around Michigan, Ohio, California, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, I mean, Pennsylvania, and then now Texas. And so I think, I think part of uh, this is, uh, even in India, actually, so I, I, I grew up in Dhanbad uh, on the east, uh, eastern side, and then I was in Bombay, yeah. and then I was in Maharashtra, northern Maharashtra. So uh, I think what happens is that if you've had a life of moving around quite a bit, like Mithali was saying, you, you're not, home is everywhere home isn't any one yeah. place. And yeah. 
and as a writer, I think that's really cool in a way because it works to your advantage because whenever you go to some place, you're going to be looking at it um, from the eyes of an outsider. You're going to be exploring it and looking at it with maybe a fresh set of eyes. And that's definitely been the case for me. So with my writing, I'm definitely, you know, still trying to explore and understand. I, I, I usually, my writing is driven by questions. And so I'm always, if I'm writing about something, it's because I'm not, I don't understand it. I have to write about it to figure it out in my head. And so that's my primary driver. And so whatever I'm writing, whichever place I'm writing about, whichever culture I'm writing about, it's because I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to make some sense of it, trying to connect some of the dots. So with my upcoming short story collection, for example, there are right. stories that are set in, in the UK. There are stories set in the US. There are stories that are set in Mumbai, Gujarat, you know, so they're, like me, the stories are from all over, although there's a uniting theme in that, which is, you know, it's the intersection of labor yeah. and our emotional lives. And so I think to your question is the itinerant life has certainly reflected in my writing. It certainly helps me approach a, a place with the eyes of uh, somebody who's more of an explorer. Um, I, I'm not looking, when I go, when I explore in my work, I'm not looking to fully describe a place as authentically as I can. I'm looking, as you've said before, I'm looking to share my perspective. This is how I, as an outsider, see what's going on. And I think there's some merit to having that perspective, at least for me as a writer. So yeah, that's how I approach, you know, my, that's how that, my life uh, and my writing. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating because apart from the Kolkata connection, I was born and raised in Bihar. Uh, ah. uh, not too far from Dhanbad, so in, in, mm -hmm. in a copper mine town called Khachila, which is its own literary uh, greatness through the writings of Bibhudabhushan Bandhapadhyay, the uh, author who, on whose film uh, Pathet Panchali, uh, The Song of the Road, a Ray's famous film, is based. Um, we have some brilliant questions coming in from <laughs> our audience this evening here. Uh, I'll start with one from uh, Rana and I'll quickly summarize this question uh, as I go along. This is for all three of you. Please feel free to volunteer. So what does religion um, play a, a major, uh, uh, is, is it a huge factor in the identity of immigrants uh, abroad? Uh, and is that is that related to the kind of jingoistic patriotism, Rana says? Um, uh, towards the country of origin. Um, what, what, uh, Jenny, wh why don't you, uh, would you like to take that question and as we move to Guru and then Dali on that question of religious identity and immigration? Um, well, see, for me, um, I was born in a Hindu family, but um, my religious identity has never really been an important um, Tribe, uh, you know, where, where, whenever I've, you know, wherever I've lived, because what I've done, and and I don't know if everyone does this, but I go along with the local culture. And so when I was in the UK, uh, Christmas Eve, I went to church with my friends. New Year's Day, I would go for the morning service. Um, here in the US, you know, my husband is Punjabi, and so we go to the Gurdwara, uh, the local Gurdwara. So for me. I find just assimilating in that sense because I'm very curious about those religions. To me, a religion is really a, a way of life, right? There are traditions, there are rituals, there are aspects to that culture. And so it's not so much um, about, and, and you know, I'm also curious about different belief systems. So for me, I have not found that to be an issue. Now, I agree, religion is a big part of immigrant identity. Um, and we've seen in the US some very uh, dangerous effects of that, where we've had, um, you know, very recently, you know, um, that there was that there have been attacks on uh, minority religious uh, places of worship, um, and so I understand that, and I understand the seriousness of how re how important religion is a part of immigrant identity. Uh, I, I just don't have the best answer for myself personally. I, to me, I just assimilate in whichever culture I'm in. I try to understand and get to know the religion of that place. Right. Uh, can I uh, quickly come to Guru for a short, quick answer to that question about the role of religion in your writing? Is that important? Sure. Or? Yeah, I think uh, 
it does play a huge role again i'll tell a quick story which conveys my point uh again you know my writing is a, a product of my work and i can tell that like if i were not if i was not a physician especially emergency physician i wouldn't have been a writer probably uh i was working in an er one shift and uh, some guy came in after like 6 to 8 hours after dislocating his shoulder he fell and dislocated his shoulder he did come in uh basically he was a veteran you know he had worked in a uh, like a, he had gone to afghanistan for war and he had lost one of his legs and it, because of that he had become like a drug addict you know like a narcotic uh, abuse because of multiple medication that he had taken in and uh, he came in he tried he asked me can you put the shoulder back without giving me any narcotic pain medications without putting me to sleep i said like i don't think it's possible because you have you've done this quite a bit uh you know you, you this shoulder is out for like a long time and uh, uh, i have to sedate you before that his worry is you know it's like alcoholics right like when uh, they even they sip a drop of alcohol they fall off the wagon so he is like thinking that if you put me to sleep by giving me narcotics i'll probably become like you know start abusing narcotics again so please don't do this and we tried and tried nothing happened so i had to sedate him before he was going to sleep he looked at me and told doctor are you an arab he asked me are you an arab and that didn't really are you a muslim are you an arab and that didn't really i i, I mean he felt he fell asleep and he woke up and then once the shoulder is back and when they come out uh he was you know he was swearing uh he was swearing profusely uh, you know with the anti muslim rhetoric and uh, i didn't really get exactly what was saying then he apologized you know for no muslim, no fault of his you know he just by being in the war going to a different country and thinking that i was an arab you know he, it's like a ptsd for him so these kind of things do happen and uh, my the novel hijab is based on this religion culture and how it affects uh, our identity as an american you know because all of us come to this country to be an american or to get to part of to be a part of this american dream and exactly what this american dream is what do we identify as whom do we identify as american uh, is something that we need to ask ourselves and religion which religion you you are coming from especially in post 911 period this becomes like a huge huge factor that's what i think yeah. over to you uh, mithali to address the question of uh, religion or faith in your writings i'll just touch on it quickly i think the distinction that uh, jenny made between the cultural artifacts of a religion and the belief is very important to me because um uh so i think both of the, the cultural part of it is it makes it's it the traditions the holidays those things you know when i had my first christmas here in america and i didn't know anything about christmas i just thought some fat guy came and gave presents to everyone else except me and then that's how i viewed christmas as it was very much as an outsider so but then there's that true meaning of christmas which i didn't hear until much later So I think the belief and the culture are very different. Her second question uh Rana I'm not sure if it's a, the, the, their second question is the jingoistic patriotism toward the country of origin does that come with it? I would say the opposite that uh when you cross a border as I said it keeps you uh, really close to both cultures you're able to see both the good and the bad in both cultures and so I think I've lost any ability to be patriotic jingoistically whether it be in india you know they just renamed i know you guys know the the fair and lovely skin cream to glow and lovely skin cream but uh growing up those skin creams were always thrust at me and uh to use um and i hated it i resisted it but here of course you can see the way that elders are treated so horribly here in america and i think i watched my parents honor their parents and i'm trying to do the same with my parents as they age um so that comes right out of my bengali village heart so i would say that i'm able to see good in both systems and 
and also some of the things that need to be corrected in both. So there's no patriotism that's jingoistic. I start, sadly, I've lost the ability to really say, yeah, I'm an American. Oh, I love India. It's perfect in every way. It's gone forever for me. If I can just uh, add one little sentence, you know, yes, when you please. talked about jingoistic patriotism, uh, I know uh, probably Mitali and Jenny, your experience is a bit different than mine. Uh, I think uh, the very typical example that you see uh, nowadays is like a middle-class uh, corporate sector working like a Hindu, mostly mostly Hindu uh, Americans, many meaning like you know Hindu Indians who are who have the job and uh, they're raising their family in in America. They start complaining about mushrooming of uh, all these uh, madrasas and uh, uh, masks in, uh, in the streets of India in Bangalore, whereas they don't complain about uh, mushrooming of temples in America. You know, it's like uh, we want whichever serves to our purpose. You know, we are like one of those uh, guys which if it serves to be, serves to have an anti-Trump rhetoric here, we would do that because it serves to our purpose. Whereas if you go back to India, it will be completely opposite. So I think, I don't know if you call this as religion or like jingoism, whatever you can, you see that quite a bit. I think we need to look and touch on that mm. because that is like a real issue. Uh, we kind of change our ident identity based on where we are, just based on who, whether it serves I, our purpose yeah. or not. It, that's I a think political it's, it's, identity, I would, right? Yeah. yeah. It is. It is. It is almost an opportunistic exceptionalism, is how I'll call it. Yeah. Jenny, would you like to take that question from Vijay Lakshmi, which is a really very interesting question about whether um, Western publishers' view of Indian writing, whether it's too Indian or not Indian enough. Uh, I think if you would. Like it, to it's that. you know it. That is a question that I think I could probably eventually write an essay about because I've had <laughs> uh, experiences with publishing in India where even though I grew up in India and I go back and forth, I lived, I, I spent the last six years actually living in India, but I've had experiences where they felt sometimes that my writing wasn't Indian enough because I've been out of India. And then when you come here and I'm writing uh, about India, then it's like, oh, well, it's too Indian. And we've already got an Indian author this year, you know, so I don't know that we want to take you on necessarily. And so I've had kind of experiences on both sides and, you know, with my translation work as well. I, I think the, the Bernadine Evaristo was quoted in that one article and there's this huge diversity in publishing um, study that was done in the UK, uh, which I read, you know, all 44 pages of and I tweeted the whole thing because it was so important. I, I believe that things are getting better in terms of publishers being more aware that there is more than one Indian story and that there are uh, different experiences and different South Asian narratives. It's not just all about slums and uh, terrorism and immigration and arranged marriages, that there are many other kinds of stories. So I do believe that's opening up a little bit, but I think we have a long way to go. Um, just recently, this year in particular, there have been two, um, what have been, what, what the uh, US and the UK presses have called, uh, runaway bestsellers uh, from Indian origin authors. And nothing to take away from those authors who I will not name, but nothing to take away from those authors, but they have definitely picked up on the, those uh, time-worn tropes of uh, slum life and terrorism. And so what happens is that's what Western publishers and Western readers get, right? They get those time-worn tropes and they're used to those. And so they're not wanting to look at other human stories. And in India or South Asia, we're not just about those things. We're about so many things. So I do believe that there's a lot more work that needs to be done as far as uh, pub the publishing industry opening up to different narratives and opening up to different tropes and stories. Um, but it is better than when I started querying my book in 2017. It's definitely moving in the right direction. We've lost audio. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Amanda. 
Yeah. Depends on your mute. You're on mute. Hi. So yeah, I think that's a great prompt uh, uh, for me to come to Mitali to respond to Kirsten's question, which is on uh, if all literature is immigrant literature, doesn't this disregard or even erase indigenous literatures? Would you like to respond to that question, uh, Mitali? And then we will. I'll come back to the uh, panelists for your final summary. Yes, that becomes a very that becomes a question that is really looking at the question of appropriation and power. Um, I think I, I answered it in the in the chat a little bit about the fact that most indigenous cultures now are, can't remain untouched as storytellers by the majority culture. They have to cross borders as well, but it becomes a question of power and storytelling is a very powerful um, media. Who tells the story about whom? Who solves the problem? Who saves the day? Those are all big yeah. questions. And uh, we're wrestling with that as a writing community who has the right to tell a story. Uh, so I think for the indigenous peoples who are traditionally oppressed and marginalized, even to the point of genocide, their voices have been silenced for so long that um, history matters. The history of a storyteller matters. Yeah. I wrote Rickshaw Girl. Um, you know, I'm from a Hindu family and it's about a Muslim Bangladeshi uh, rickshaw puller's daughter. And so when I wrote it in the States, people said, oh, she's tapping into her indigenous culture, Bengali culture. And you know, if you know anything about the history of Hindu Bengalis and, Beng and Muslim Bengalis, you know that my ancestors oppressed Muslims. You know that I come from that, you know, in East Bengal, we were the landowners. So uh, it's, it's just as much of a power border crossing for me as it would be for a white writer to write about an indigenous um, yeah. person here in, in the States. So it becomes a question of power and appropriation. And I think as writers, we have to think very, very carefully about what border crossings are we making in telling the story? And if there's somebody else who is close to his ancestry, I think history and ancestry does matter. We'd like to think it doesn't, but it does. Who my, which types of people my ancestors killed matters. Um, and right. so I have to ask these questions. And, and I, I, I try to, I don't think that that means that we can't cross any border. I think it means that we have to do it very humbly. And there's a time period now for indigenous peoples where they haven't been able to tell their own stories. So I would say now's the time to back off, shut up and just uh, let other voices come up that are more closer to the culture. I think that's a very powerful word you used, you know, approaching this very humbly. And I'm reminded of the uh, 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 wonderful African proverb it says that if the lions wrote the stories of their of the hunts, the ending would have been different. Um, so uh, I think um, thank you for those wonderful perspectives. I think we're running out of time. I would come back to uh, all of the wonderful authors for this uh, great evening with one final question, uh, which uh, I just formulated as, uh, even as we were speaking, which is, uh, could you tell us about one object at home? which inspires uh, your writing uh, because this is also about belonging and objects so one of reflect on one object at home um, that uh, inspires your writing um, who will take this first um, uh, Mitali you already have uh, got something wonderful what's that tell us about it that is my daddy I have the picture there he was a wonderful storyteller I adored him. I was a complete daddy's girl, and he was so proud of me. And that's me with my little chubby cheeks in there, same chubby cheeks I have today. Come from my daddy. My storyteller's heart comes from my dad. I miss him every minute. And so I put that there to remind me that, um, you know, my, my love for stories came from, from my dad. Right. Um, uh, just a quick um, sort of apologies from my side. I, I was under the impression this goes on till nine, but it goes on till nine thirty, which is great because we have so much to talk about. But let me persist with that line of question. Uh, so over to um, Guru. I mean, uh, tell us about one object that inspires your writing, and then we will carry on this wonderful chat that we are having and Adda, as we call it in Bengali. One object like now i'm a little confused one object at home you say yeah at home or you know an, an object that uh, that is uh, intrinsic to you 
that inspires your writing. But you can't talk about the stethoscope. So no, yeah, right. Will not See, that's the problem, it. right? <laughs> so I, I, I think the storytelling in me was uh, probably there from for a long time. You know, I used to narrate stories, but uh, I never thought that I was going to be a writer. Uh, I think listening to great stories from my parents and uh, reading reading books mostly you know i never read like you know english literature for a long time you know till i didn't uh, uh, read i never read that for a long time till i was like my teenager in medical school uh, and uh, i think you know mostly my reading and writing or listening to stories probably was the object uh, that inspired me uh, again i had to come back to my professional life because that's where I get most of my stories from, but uh, I'm not going to touch on that at this point because I have talked many things about it. If I may come to uh, Denny, one object. Yeah, so like you as an author. I have, I have my mom, and oh. she was. It's right there on my on my desk. So. Uh, she was a big storyteller and a big reader. She loved Gujarati literature. Of course, with five children, she was a full-time uh, housewife and mom and was not able to do what she wanted to do, which is read and write and translate. And so the short story collection that I've got coming out this year happens to be, um, you know, uh, happens to have a story that she used to tell us a lot, a folk tale, a Gujarati folk tale um, that I've written about as, and included a mother figure telling that story. And, and also Dumketu, the Gujarati short story pioneer, um, he, he was one of her favorite writers. And uh, my first literary translation is a collection of short stories of Dumketu, which will be out at the end of this year in India with HarperCollins. So she certainly inspired both of my first books and I've written about her elsewhere and she passed away in 2014, but you know, she's still with me every single day. Yeah. It's interesting. Thank you uh, so you much. That's a, yeah. Right, when you code switch as a, as a child, one of the things that you learn how to do is read faces very well. And so even looking at her picture there, mm. Jenny, I can see, the sense of humor in her face, just from that picture. Yes. Oh, yes, very much so. Yeah. yeah. And her father yeah. was an accountant um, in Africa, and she was all he he was also a translator, and so you know, kind of cast down the generation. Right. So, so a very layered um, history of um, uh, travel and migration in your family. Yes. Uh, I wonder if uh, one of you would like to take this very interesting question from Niharika Balian. She asks, do you think that after crossing borders, and I think border crossing is a very important trope in our discussion today, the diaspora, uh, and again, a very interesting term there, the diaspora, especially upper class Hindus, take along with them the ideas of casteism, and in the process of retaining their identity, they end up reinforcing this even more. Um, uh, Jenny, would you like to begin by responding it? And then Mitali and Guru, I'll come to you in that order. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I do believe, yes, that there is a lot of casteism in the South Asian diaspora. I'll give you a very quick example. I worked in Silicon Valley for seven years. And um, I worked in the tech sector. And believe it or not, but there was casteism among Indian folks, uh, even in Silicon Valley, where we had, um, you know, folks from the Dalit community, and then you had folks from upper caste Hindu community. And I remember having arguments with my client team about topics related to this, where I felt that somebody was being excluded when they shouldn't have been from certain things, or somebody wasn't getting the credit. And uh, you know, so I definitely think it, it does happen in the diaspora. And yes, maybe part of it is that we like to, it's a way of clinging to an identity for some folks. Um, you know, I don't know how we get rid of it because it's still there. And, you know, even right now, there's been so much talk about with Black Lives Matter and you, you'll hear so much talk about how the South Asian community also has anti-Blackness. Uh, there are people who yeah. are against 
um, you know, and so there, there is that as well. So it goes beyond casteism. It goes, it takes. And I think we have the wonderful film Mississippi Masala, which alludes, yes. uh, you know, which uh, tackles it head on. Um, it does, right? So, so yeah, it exists. Uh, it very much. I yeah. think the question is a valid question. It very much exists. Um, I see it in WhatsApp forwards from well-meaning elderly South Asian folks uh, in, in the forward messages that they send. You still see that happening even yeah. today. So it exists. Yeah. And I don't know. I think each generation we get a little better. And so hopefully it will continue to improve. Yeah. Right. Um, if I may come to you, Mithali, on the question of uh, casteism crossing borders with us uh, as we travel. Um, it's interesting because if, if, a, if, let's say, a majority white writer was writing about casteism in India, uh, that it, it matters who's telling the story, I think, because um, there tends to be among, the farther you are away from a culture, uh, you tend to either become more reverential, like people will say, oh, Indian culture, oh, yoga, and, and uh, oh, chicken tikka masala, and oh, I love it so much. And that's their connection there. And you know, then they'll ask me, Guru, they'll say, oh, my doctor is Indian. Do you know him? You know, like, <laughs> so all these connections they're trying to make, right? But they, they're so distant from the culture that they tend to be very reverential because they're well-meaning. I see that as a, that sort of well-meaning approach. Uh, the closer we are though, we see some of the, the issues like shadism, um, casteism, the role of women and gender in the villages. Those things are things that, I, I lived, I was a third yeah. daughter when yeah. I was born and Absolutely. everybody wept when I was born. The whole family cried, um, um, including my mother. Uh, so she grew up in the village, as I said, she thought it was her fault. She was taught that she had to give her husband a son and she didn't. It's one of the reasons why she left Kolkata, I think, is just to get away from that shaming of having three daughters. Um, and then I remember taking high school biology and learning a, about the X and the Y chromosome guru. You, you as a doctor will appreciate this, how science helped my mother. I came running home and I said, mom, I explained the X and the Y. She was so happy. She said, oh, it is your daddy's fault. She was so excited that it wasn't, she was released from her shame thanks to science. So um, I think that I lived that. And so when I can write that, uh, when it comes to gender, I, I did live that. So I think that it does matter how close you are to the culture because you can explore both the positives and the negatives um, in a way. And I think that's why the immigrant writer is important. And I, I know I didn't, I said I wasn't an immigrant writer, but a writer who's lived that kind of border crossing, who can see both cultures and, and translate, as Gurd said so beautifully, both uh, a very honest look at, at the culture. As, and I'm sure there's issues in my own writing, yeah. too reverential or too, um, you know, but I still think I'm a little closer because I lived it. Right. Thanks. Over to you, Guru. I mean, how does that uh, question affect your writing? Yeah, I think uh, does it, at all? it does affect, you know, I think uh, to put it simply, uh, carrying the baggage of upper caste Hinduism, or like, you know, belonging to upper class hin Hindu, or be you being a upper class Hindu and immigrating to America, uh, carries this bias of uh, your one shade close to whiteness. You're brown, you're in between black and white, and uh, what exactly were you thinking when you thought of moving to America? What was your American dream? And uh, when we try to buy a house, what did our friends tell you? You know, don't go and buy in this neighborhood, there are too many blacks there. And uh, when we came to, when I, you know, I came to Detroit, uh, to do my residency when I was walking from my apartment, when I'm walking my apartment to the hospital, I was told like, you know, watch out for, you know, watch out for these muggers. And uh, if something happens, just give, hand them a dollar. So this bias is uh, like, you know, we carry this bias and uh, that if you are a Dalit coming to America, you probably will identify with the person, where exactly do you identify? You know, you probably identify with the black person who has probably gone through the same, led, leading the same life that you have led. Whereas if you are an upper caste Hindu, you kind of think that, you know, I'm above them. And even now, I just give an example. I was, uh, I went and, you know, uh, participated in Black Lives Matter movement and I went for the protest and everything. I was jogging around my neighborhood and uh, one black guy who was coming with his earphone on 
he said yo and without knowing without without realizing i sped up you know for like 2 minutes and for 10 seconds my pace when i was i was pacing and when i looked when i turned around and looked he happened to me a colleague of mine from 2 years you know he was also a doctor but this bias intrinsic bias you know i couldn't recognize him and i was like so felt so ashamed when i when i stopped and talked to him yeah he said you are you know you are oh guru you are the racist that runs you are not, you are not the racist that kills you know this is something that we carry in our mind and this is because of our you know probably upbringing where we and we carry these biases with us and this just stays with us and you know probably this will get better with the next generation but we carry these biases with us and we have to acknowledge that it's the first thing that we need to do if you acknowledge yes we have these biases we have to get rid of it then at least it is a first step towards uh, you know making me a better person i think uh, that's such a powerful and honest admission guru than thank you for sharing this with all of us and it's not easy to own up to one's own um, limitations and biases um, and you know i mean and uh, mitali mentioned shadeism which is a wonderful uh, term um ever know makes a lot of Uh, on uh, about uh, this in in his own takes on america and, and and south africa but also brings indians into the mix very recently um one of my friends and quite a prominent novelist from kolkata sandeep roy uh, wrote about this in 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 one of uh, i think in the mint lounge uh, about exactly that experience that you described guru about when he he goes to the uh, to the us as a student he uh, experiences this that he is advised by other indian students not to um, uh, rent a house in 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 uh, so called disreputable parts of uh, town as a student in the uk i faced uh, i've seen that being advised been advised on on these things and working for an international organization which is based in the uk i find uh, the you know we have wonderful equality diversity inclusion values edi we call them in in short uh, but you know they are very um anglocentric for the lack of a better word i call them eurocentric Uh, parameters that you know completely is blind to caste issues so i think it's it's a challenge in in many of the lives we lead and and i i say this with great humility again a a, a word that mitali used earlier and uh jenny also referred to uh, as an uh, uh, someone with an upper caste surname i do not believe in caste but uh, 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 with the upper caste surname i have to deal with this day in day out and with great uh, uh, humility and and stepping back from positions of discourses of privilege so it's it's quite um it's it's difficult and and but i think it's the conversation needs to happen and action needs to happen on that uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, interesting uh, questions that have come up and i would like uh, um uh, the panel to address them there's one from nitya uh, from uh, the belong team uh, which talks about what are your takes on the term third culture kids what identities does this term amplify and what does it silence um third culture kids um um uh, any one of you guru you are on the screen maybe you would like to go first then we can come to jenny and then mitali on this question so if i understand uh, third culture kids then i if i understand that right they're like growing up in america our kids were growing up in america is that right yeah i well i, I think so i think okay, so yeah. yeah very very you know it's like they their identity is also very fluid i can very clearly say uh, i was helping with my daughter's uh, college essay you know she grew up in uh, rochester minnesota which is not a big town you know lots of uh, lutherans around you know you know lutheran christians around and uh, she grew up and uh, when she asks even my son is like 40 15 years old when you ask them where are you from they say i'm from rochester my parents are from india this is the typical response you get but when they write the college story as college essay their 
indian uh, indian as all of a sudden comes into it, it come, you know comes into forefront because they need to identify themselves as someone unique someone different with some unique upbringing which is going to which is going to like show them that they are different than other people uh, other kids in college they have to pick up their application first what makes them unique is their indianness probably i think that is how they grow up they always i think the second generation uh, they always carry this uh, badge of uh, indian uh, you know indian kids most of the times but i think the way that they are different than us is they have no at least you know i can speak for myself they have they have no idea of what casteism is and they have no idea what caste that you know they belong and when you go to india when they do you know the straight you know when they see all these things with their grandparents they kind of just are completely lost because they have no idea what caste is yes. at least you know that phase is gone and uh, they still grow up as a bit confused kids but i think their next generation probably uh, things are going to be lot better i mean better in the sense what you know you need to in these days it's very difficult to define what's good and what's bad you know what i think was not good with me is going to get better with them that's how i feel it as it's all it's it's all very relative i think that's a, that's a very uh, powerful observation uh, guru because uh, i'm reminded of uh, nandan nilakanni's book uh, imagining india where he refers to uh, migration from indian villages to cities and, and he has this great hope that a large scale migration to indian cities will over a period of time annihilate caste in india um uh, but it hasn't happened uh, uh, or is in the process of happening uh, i hope that's the case um i if i can come to you uh, jenny for a quick response to that question on third culture kids right so um i don't actually have kids but i have a lot of nephews and nieces in the us and they are third culture children and i would say i i do agree with guru prasad that some of the issues that say my generation of third culture kids um who are my friends uh you know indian americans who were born and raised in 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 the us um some of the issues that they dealt with some of the let's call it uh challenges with place and race and caste etc and and having to kind of you know uh jump on both sides of the indian american hyphenated identity um i think those are getting better uh with the current generation you know teens that's growing up Um I want to mention you know since we are all writers I want to recommend two quick books that that have come out this year um by two writers one she herself was is a third generation person uh Sejal Shah has a book of memoir essays and she talks a lot about growing up as Indian American as Gujarati on the east coast in Rochester and um beautiful essays that i think give a give a lot of light to this topic of being a third culture kid and that's a book that's come out this year so i'm just going to mention that i i got to know her through the podcast uh and then real quick just going back to the earlier question about casteism in the diaspora um samir pandya has a book out this month called members only he's a bay area writer and he talks about a an upper caste hindu whose name uh, is Rajput so we share the same last name his protagonist and I um and that person has to deal with um uh, certain anti black biases that he may have had as an upper caste hindu in america so those two books actually shed light on both the topic of this question as well as the one we just had before and i i just wanted to mention those are good reads if anyone's looking for those right uh over to you mitali on your perspective on that very interesting but tricky question uh yes yeah two thoughts on that uh third culture kids uh i think it's another way of saying they're kids who are residing who have grown up between cultures as i like to call it so you you mm, you do that yeah. um back and forth dance that i did there is that perspective yeah. but that term tends to res- um tends mostly to be used by children who are from the west who grow up in other other countries like with international schools or um 
with whatever parents who are residing overseas, but they originate in the West. Uh, because it's a power of question, right? When you cross a border, if you're being raised as a white person, a white child in um, India, you're going to you're going to get a certain deference from that um, that the the group of people who adulate whiteness, who still adulate mm. the colonial uh, yeah. whiteness, the power associated with whiteness. So you're still walking around with that privilege of being white, and so that's a different experience than say a Haitian who settles in Maine and um, grazes a child there, that is that person, yes, essentially they're both third cultured children, but the power differential there is, is enormous in uh, how they're perceived by the majority culture. So I, I lived in Bangladesh for three years. And um, one of the surprising fallouts of that is because I am large and strong and look sort of like I've had power, I was treated very deferentially there. And after three years, I found uh, that it was taking a, a toll on my soul. I was starting to um, maybe subtly respond to that, how people were treating me with that, a power, uh, as though I was a person of power. And I hated that myself. I hated seeing that because I'm used to sort of being ignored here in the, in the States when I come up to a hotel counter. Um, people, maybe there's that split second where they might look to the white person instead of me. I'm used to sort of, and I like being on the margins of power. It's better for my soul than it is being in that place of power. It's the same thing I feel about not crossing borders. People always say, oh, it's immigrant kids have such a hard time. I would say it's non, people who don't cross cultural borders, they're the ones that are at risk here because your soul becomes at risk when you can't leave your own box of your own culture. And all you see is that that is a risky place for your soul to be. So I would say that, that, that there's a lot of nuance in that third culture thing that comes with the, uh, how powerful you're perceived in the culture where you're, you're being raised. So, Devanjan is on mute. You're still muted. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, sorry, I, I keep uh, muting and I'm muting because uh, you know, if I'm typing something, I don't want that sound to be picked up by the microphone. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for those uh, very open and frank um, sort of uh, responses to this. Uh, you know, the, these responses are sometimes too close to the bone and can be quite difficult. Um, uh, if I sort of quickly go back to the chat that I think we were having on the on the panelists uh, chat box. Uh, if I could come back to the idea of translation again, I think uh, um, we had some really wonderful uh, thoughts from uh, Guru in that uh, in the earlier part of our conversation on translation. And I'm trying to pick that uh, also your comment with that uh, what you felt about Tagore's translation in English. And when I taught in uh, Vishwabharati, I did teach uh, um, Gitanjali song offerings, translation as, as a translated text. And there's so much in there because Tagore translated himself and he translated very loosely and he was, his language um, was not very contemporary English of the early uh, 20th century, but of the previous century. He was deeply influenced by Tennyson. So many of his phrases, if you look closely, echo Tennyson's uh, in memoriam in particular. Um, uh, so the, I just wanted to open this up to everyone uh, that, you know, um, as um, how does translation impact you uh, as authors living uh, in a country that uh, you, you call home now, but uh, what's the position of translation? Does it help you reach greater audiences? Does it help you access other works that uh, in turn inspire you? I would love to hear from all three of you on this. Uh, I'll, I'll go. So um, I'm also a translator. So I translate from Gujarati to English. Um, and I think the first and foremost, all writers, regardless of the language that we speak in, we are all translators, right? We're translating some thoughts, ideas, uh, experiences into language, things that we feel and think into words. And so I think we're all translators. I think just my experience of actual physical translation, you know, going from source 
one source language to a target language. Um, I like to make sure that people understand that it's not just about converting language from one to another. We, we are converting entire experiences, entire cultures. So we have to, we as translators, we're immersing ourselves, just as writers also, immersing ourselves in a certain culture before we can translate it. And so I do believe in that sense, immigrants, people like us who have lived different cultures, who immersed ourselves in different cultures, perhaps that has given us a bit of an ability to be able to do that um, in our writing then, is to be able to translate entire cultures and, and immerse ourselves first and then translate the culture as we translate experiences. Um, I think that for me, for example, I, you know, my editor in India right now, uh, it's interesting the conversations she and I are having as we're editing the translation, because the writer that, are, that you know, like, actually, Dumketu was a contemporary of Tagore's, and he had a lot of respect for Tagore, and he met Tagore and everything. He translated Tagore's work as well into Gujarati. Now, what's interesting is, though, that Dumketu isn't as well known, because a lot of his work has not been translated. There's a lot more people translating from Bengali to English than there are from Gujarati to English. So what happens is, when you look at the stories that were written about the same time as Tagore's stories, and, and you know, my editor in India is reading the stories that I've translated and they're like, oh, but there's a lot of caste in this. And I said, well, he was a social reformer, this writer. He's trying, he's not casteist himself. He's trying to show that people are casteist. There's a difference. And we have to understand that when we read translated works that the, the work itself doesn't necessarily reflect who the writer is they are trying to translate their own experiences and their own culture into a story. And so I think the more we read translations and we see them as works in their own right, the better we will understand other languages. That's also one way to travel. That's also one way to immerse ourselves into other cultures. And so I, I definitely yeah. encourage more people to read works in translation, especially from India. I mean, Arunava Sinha just did a recent uh, post at Words Without Borders where he said 10 yeah. translated novels that we should all be reading right now. And the reason is because every time there's a question that comes up about books from India, they're almost all in the English language, right? Every yeah. time somebody yeah. does a post at the Guardian or some big yeah. venue, it's always yeah. all English. No, and, uh, and that, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, translation is travel is, is a wonderful phrase and, and Ornavo has done a brilliant job in in taking uh, a lot of uh, Bengali literature, certainly to the wider world. Uh, he translated uh, Shankar's uh, Chaurangi, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. I mean, given that how long it took such seminal novel to be translated into English. Um, over to you, Guru. Uh, I think you uh, were, you started this conversation and uh, then I'll come to me about uh, her thoughts on translation. Well, uh... It's very simple. I am on this panel because somebody translated my novel from Kannada to English. Otherwise, probably none of you would have heard about my novel. I've been writing for 20 years, and this is the first time uh, one of my uh, works was translated, even though a few of my short stories were translated. So I think there is a, uh, you know, we wouldn't have known Marquez or Juan Rulfo or, you know, lots of these uh, wonderful writers uh, if there were no translations. And uh, we, I echo Jenny's thought that uh, uh, there is a wonderful, you know, what we see right now, the translated works of Canada to English, like Gachar Gochar or like uh, multiple exactly. other things. Yeah, Mohan, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, these are like, you know, Vivek is a good friend of mine, it's a wonderful book, but these are like just the tips of iceberg. There is a wonderful, wonderful Canada uh, literature, uh, some of which, can be translated, some of which it's very hard to translate those because the, kind of, the language is so powerful, it's very hard to get the essence of that to English. So I don't think we should even try to translate those works. And Arunava mentions, and I, uh, I, and I have great respect for Arunava's work, and he does mention uh, a bad translation is better than no translation at all because as long as you get something, yeah. And, uh, and you know, so the, it might get better afterwards. You know, you just go ahead and get, do the translations, and then let's see how how it sticks. Sure. And uh, yeah, it might. 
you know, we need those in Canada. We have not had like that luxury of having Arunava Sinha translating. He says like he translates like 250 to 300 page book in one month, 3000 oh words God. in a day. Yeah, so. He's, 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 he's prodigious. He's, like, he's a yeah. very ah, good yeah. friend of mine. Yeah. <laughs> I know, yeah. he's yeah. very, very prodigious. Uh, yeah. I think we have just about enough time for Mitali to have the yeah. final word on translation. And then we will have to bring this wonderful discussion to a, a, a close. Uh, but over to you, Mitali. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, the important, we have to keep in mind the relationship around a story belongs equally to the reader and the writer. We as writers can do all our due diligence in translation and language and in examining our intentions and uh, our appropriation and we can come do all of our due diligence, but essentially a story belongs to the reader and the reader is going to do their work of translation and that's the mystery of story is that the reader takes it and I can't say, oh, especially to a child, because I write for young people, this is the message, this is what I want you to take out. Sometimes I hear from readers, things they took out of my novels that I didn't even imagine was in there. And that's the power of a story is that the, the reception of the story, it's dialectical, it belongs to the reader and the writer. And we have no control over what the reader's gonna do at the end of the day with that story. And that's really the mystery and the beauty of it. Right. Uh, thank you, um, panelists. It, it, does any one of you want to have one final word before we bring it to a close? No, just to say thank you to all of you, thank the you folks so at Team Belong and, and, and you. And, and it's yeah. been a terrific conversation. Yes, thank you so much. So thank interesting. you, everyone. To Guru and Jenny for a long, long time, more time than this. So thank yeah. you. Okay. Same thank here. You so I mean, I, it's it. really it is a real pleasure to talking to all of you and i would like to place my thanks to the belong uh, online literature festival team for having convened this wonderful panel and this festival which has had such a you know real resonance uh, uh, across um, our networks across the world and my colleagues in the literature team uh, here in british council india for this collaboration that they set up with uh, the Belong uh, Online Literature Festival. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good night. Uh, and again, morning, afternoon to everyone, <laughs> wherever you are uh, tuning into this wonderful conversation. And I hope we will be in touch, um, uh, uh, the, the four of us, certainly. It's really, yes. really wonderful speaking to you. And if you happen to be in Kolkata, uh, please give me a buzz. You have my contacts. Love to meet up and, and you know, have an other uh, uh, a meal with you that would be wonderful. Sure. Thank, thank you. you to all our sure. panelists and their banjan. As someone who has moved four countries in the past eight years and currently goes to school in the US, I felt very at home in this discussion and listening to all of you share your personal stories. So thank you so much for that. Um, and their banjan, thank you for doing a fantastic job um, at moderating. We, it was an amazing panel. You're far too kind. Um, thank you to all our audience for tuning in and staying put today. Um, tomorrow, we begin at, um, at, th at 3 p.m. with uh, a panel on sexual rights and freedom in India um, with the panelists Parmesh Sahani, Saurabh Kirpal, and Madhavi Menon, and moderated by Anish Gawande. Um, so we look forward to seeing you there and engaging with you more. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.